And good morning, everyone. Bonjour. I see that people are joining. We're going to start in just one moment once we've given uh, the participants from around the world the chance to connect to this event, uh, the launch of Gil Losher's Refugees, a very short introduction. So we'll start in just one moment. Okay, and with that, uh, let's begin. I see that uh, colleagues are still connecting to the webinar, uh, but in the interest of time, let's begin. And let me begin by saying hello, bonjour. Uh, my name is James Milner. I'm in the Department of Political Science at Carleton University in Ottawa, Canada. And I have the real uh, pleasure of being the project director for LEARN, the Local Engagement Refugee, uh, Refugee Research Network. Um, it's a real honor and a bittersweet joy to be hosting today's event to launch Gil Losher's book, Refugees, A Very Short uh, Introduction. Um, this uh, is, is a remarkable book that uh, it deserves a, a, a fulsome discussion, and we're very fortunate to have uh, a great group uh, with us today to discuss the book. Uh, this is a great book by an irreplaceable scholar teacher, mentor, and friend uh, who we sadly lost in April of last year. Uh, today's event is a chance to celebrate this book and to discuss why it was so important to Gil. Uh, I'd like to begin by acknowledging that the land on which I reside uh, and on which Carleton University is located is the traditional and unceded land of the Algonquin people. Uh, I say this not uh, just out of protocol and respect, but out of recognition as, of my status as a, as a settler Canadian and a recognition of the fact that the issues of dislocation and dispossession that we discuss today are also part of the history of this territory. With that, let me say how delighted I am to welcome uh, more than uh, 200 attendees to this event, many of you joining from uh, more than uh, four continents and 28 countries from around the world. Join the conversation in Twitter with the hashtag Gil Losher uh, and by tagging at learning that we can continue this conversation. And finally, we hope you enjoy the webinar. Thank you very much uh, for joining. Let me begin by saying a few words uh, about the book uh, before I invite uh, Gil's family to say a few words and to introduce our panel to discuss the book in more detail. It's no exaggeration uh, to say that Gil Losher was a founding pioneer of the field of refugee and forced migration studies um, and a real gentle giant of that field. Uh, from Calculated Kindness, co-authored with John Scanlon in 1986 through 1993's Beyond Charity, his 2001 book, UNHCR and World Politics, his scholarship defined how we can understand the international politics of refugee responses. He was also one of the most decent, kind, generous, and caring people you would ever hope to meet. He was a visiting fellow at the Refugee Study Center at the University of Oxford from 2003 until his death in 2020. Given Gill's deep and rich experience, it was nearly impossible to write this book. Everything you needed to know about refugees in 35,000 words. Over 40 years of experience and perspective condensed into 110 pages. While this proved to be Gill's last book, he felt that it was one of his most important. He wanted to write this book to cover the broad contours of a fantastically complex topic. Who are refugees and other forced migrants? What's the history of refugees as part of human history? What are the causes of refugee movements? How do we respond to refugee movements? What are the perceptions and misperceptions about refugees? And how do we better understand civil society, NGOs, and how refugees themselves are involved in responses? And then he ended the book with a very powerful uh, discussion of the challenges that lay ahead. Gill was so deeply concerned by the polarizing rhetoric relating to refugees that he wanted to write a book that was accessible, that would be read, and that would help the reader take informed positions. Personally, I think he did a masterful job. 
But it's that book that we're here to discuss today. But let me now uh, introduce Gil's family and invite them to say a few words before I introduce our speakers. And we move to a discussion of the book. Anne, Margaret, Claire, the floor is yours. Yeah. Okay. Yes, you're ready to go. Okay. <laughs> As James says, it isn't easy putting 40 years' work into 110 pages, and it took Gil a long time to write this book, deceptively small book. I'm guessing most authors of ESIs will understand that. When I first met Gil, he was 24, and clearly stated his ambition. By the time I'm 30, I want to have gotten my PhD, seen the world and written a book. He did it all, and he didn't stop at 30. There were honorary PhDs, the travel continued at an ambitious pace, and the books kept coming. That part of his life plan went on until his last day. He was very pleased to have finished the body of this VSI, but he was still working on the bibliography. Gil loved his work, he lived his work. He approached his work like he approached the basket for that deliberate, unstoppable hook shot, slowly, carefully considered, and always with gratitude to teammates who set up the play for him. He loved the teaching and the writing. So many words, and always looking for that eureka moment, the perfect way to put words together to excite compassion in people who can make a difference. VSIs are for the curious, and the power to make a difference begins with curiosity. Thank you all for coming. Gil would be very pleased. Thanks very much for that, Mum. My father was a team player from his early years on the basketball court through to his prolific career in refugee studies spanning 40 years. This quality is perhaps what made him such a compassionate researcher and a highly regarded professor. It is also what kept him with one foot in each camp, academia and policy making, and allowed him the empathy to converse with the people about whom he wrote. His last and arguably his most accessible book indicates that the team protecting the rights of refugees by necessity is growing, that the team can no longer simply consist of the large intergovernmental and international organizations and powerful individuals. In his Refugees, a very short introduction, Gill is widening the audience, and by doing so, acknowledging the impact of grassroots movements, refugee-led movements, and volunteer-based organizations helping refugees today. The field of refugee studies is work that is, unfortunately, never finished. Faced with severe disability, followed by sight and hearing loss, still my father would not and could not stop working. I was fortunate to converse with him about my volunteer work with refugees in Cambridge, UK, and was delighted when he chose the work of the Cambridge Refugee Resettlement Campaign as a case study for the VSI. I sat with him as he wrote this section of the book and saw at first hand what a struggle seeing the words on the screen had become for him and with what determination he continued. He never thought of his work as complete. And even though he is now gone, I hope his words and compassion can live on and be the seed for more. A few years ago, my father was invited to give the commencement speech to a group of American graduating university students. I remember he agonized over this speech somewhat for here was an opportunity to be a small voice against the tide of the far right and consumerist politics at a significant moment in the lives of a few hundred young Americans. The pressure was on. He did, of course, a grand job and received a standing ovation. And in his speech, he said something that we all might like to have pinned above our desks in the universities, in the seats of government, in the refugee camps. He said, be encouraged by the knowledge that history contains repeated examples of hope of resistance by individuals and organizations who have sought to achieve a more compassionate and just future. These individuals and organizations 
are not the ubiquitous someone else. These individuals and organizations are part of each of us and we are a team. Thanks, Mary. Papa loved to teach. I know this, having been a, a lifelong student of his. His way of teaching was quiet and patient and above all, compassionate. He would come home from having taught at RSC and his excitement and sheer pleasure at having spent time with his students was palpable. Papa also loved to write and the medium suited him so well he could take his time and say just what he wanted to say, weave the words together and construct the message. Just so. We've decided the royalties from this book will go into the Gil Osher Memorial Fund. This is a fund that's been set up to create an opportunity for students who might otherwise not have such an opportunity to study at the Refugee Study Centre in Oxford. It seems fitting to me that teaching and writing, these two treasured aspects of Pa's life, should come together in this way. And I think it would please Pa no end. Thank you all for being here. And over to you, James. Thank you very much, Claire. Uh, thank you, Margaret. Uh, thank you, Anne. And thank you, Otis, uh, for, for joining us. I think that's um, wonderful. Uh, so what's going to happen now is that um, Anne and, and, and Margaret and, and Claire are going to move into the audience as we move now into the, uh, the portion of the event where we have the chance to discuss uh, Gill's book. Um, what important messages it carries um, and what we think it contributes to current discussions. I'm just delighted to have four uh, friends and really valued colleagues with us to share this discussion, each of whom have a, a personal connection to Gill and, and to the book itself. Uh, I'll introduce them briefly in order uh, and then invite them each to say a few words uh, to get us started in the conversation. But uh, first, we'll hear from uh, Alexander Betts. Um, Alex is a professor of forced migration and international affairs uh, at the uh, Refugee Study Center at the University of Oxford. Um, he leads the IKEA Foundation funded refugee economies program. And his most recent book, which was published uh, just uh, within the last few weeks, uh, The Wealth of Refugees, How Displaced People Can Build Economies. Um, he collaborated with Gill on several projects, including their 2011 edited collection, uh, Refugees in International Relations, and co-authored book on UNHCR. So Alex, it's great to have you with us. Um, next, we'll hear from Jeff Crisp. Uh, Jeff is a research associate at the Refugee Studies Center at Oxford and an associate fellow in international law at Chatham House. Jeff has held senior positions with UNHCR as the head of policy development and evaluation, but also at Refugees International as senior director of policy and advocacy and as the Director of Policy and Research at the Global Commission on International Migration. He is someone with whom Gil really enjoyed discussing the themes in these books over decades. And it's wonderful to have Jeff with us today. Thank you. Third, we'll hear from Mustafa Alio. Uh, Mustafa is currently Managing Director of Our Seat, Refugees Seeking Equal Access at the Table. Our Seat is an international project that aims to uh, increase refugee inclusion in global policymaking uh, discussions. During the Global Refugee Forum in December 2019, Mustafa made history as being the first refugee advisor to participate in a delegation of the Government of Canada at a meeting of the international refugee system. Uh, Mustafa is co-founder and former managing director of Jumpstart Refugee Talent, one of the refugee-led organizations to which Gill makes reference in this book. And so Mustafa, you're very, very welcome here. And last, but by no means least, um, all the way from Dar es Salaam in Tanzania, uh, Jane Mary Rohundwa is the co-founder and executive director of Dignity Kwanzaa, a leading civil society organization advocating for refugee rights in Tanzania and in, indeed in East Africa. She's also the co-founder and chair of the Tanzania Refugee and Migration Network, Tareminet. Uh, Jane Mary was also the lead counsel in a landmark case on citizenship rights heard by the African Court on Human and People's Rights in 2018. Also of interest is that Jane Mary has been pivotal in establishing the Gil Losher Civil Society Resource Center based at the Dignity Kwanzaa offices in Dar es Salaam that will provide a permanent home 
for many of Gill's books, that is, once we figure out how to get them to Tanzania in the aftermath of the pandemic. So, Kari Busana, Swaya, bienvenue. You're all very, very welcome. What we're going to do is begin with a first round where I'll invite each of you to reflect on what you think the important messages are from the book and what contribution you think the books make, uh, the book makes. And Alex, um, let's start with you. Alex, the floor is. Thank you, James. I'm really honored to be part of this event. And I'm actually sitting in Gil's old office at the Refugee Studies Center, which is now my office. Um, Gil was a wonderful colleague, friend and mentor to me and, and so many others. Um, and he was actually the reason I came to Oxford in the first place, going back now nearly two decades. Um, I wanted to understand the politics underlying government's responses to refugees and try to make sense of experiences I'd had as an undergraduate doing voluntary work with refugees. And there was very little scholarship in this area with at least one notable exception. I discovered beyond charity as an undergraduate, trying to make sense of, of everything I'd experienced, but having no background in refugee and forced migration studies. And I found it both accessible and unique in making connections to big picture questions in world politics. Um, I started reading UNHCR and world politics during the summer of 2003 and was due to come to Oxford. I'd not even met Gill at the time of August 2003. Uh, I was immersed in his work, but then ended up following the news story of the bombing in Baghdad. Incredibly, the first time I met him was the day he returned to teaching in Oxford to start teaching his international relations and refugee course on which James was a teaching assistant. And I was so inspired that I have never left the subject area since. And I think one of the beautiful things about this book for me is it encapsulated what I discovered in Gill's writing and then Gill as a human being. As somebody who had no experience in this area but wanted to make sense of what I was seeing in person and on my television screen and in newspapers, Gill added clarity to the complexity. This is a book that offers clarity in two senses. The sense of accessibility. It is highly readable to anybody from any background, students, the general public, policymakers, practitioners, even I hope my children will be able to read it in the very near future. But it's clear in another sense as well, that of moral clarity. At a time of polarization, and this is a theme you feel throughout reading, of Gill's awareness that we're at a real fork in the road moment for the refugee system of division, divisiveness, misinformation, a real challenge for the international refugee regime. This is a book that provides a very clear moral framework. Underlying it is a sense of direction, purpose, and a sense of why the international refugee regime exists and what needs to change about it to make it effective for the people it serves. The book, as we've already heard, takes four decades of work, four decades of archival research, interviews, policy experience, influence, visits to refugee camps and cities in Africa, Asia, the Middle East, Latin America, and it distills it in a way that only someone with true mastery of the subject area could offer. It revisits themes that can be found in Gill's other work. It's about the politics, power and interests are present, but so is the moral imperative to protect and find solutions for refugees. States are major actors. UNHCR is called upon to be a facilitative and catalytic actor and to um, repeat the successes of its history. History is drawn upon in the service of understanding the present and looking forwards to the future. And as ever, there's a concern with the root causes that are so often forgotten. Beyond Charity reflected on those root causes. It reflected on the colonial legacy, civil wars, refugee warriors, separatism amongst others. It's notable how much Gill's thinking about root causes is updated in this volume to include intolerance, misinformation, technologies of war, complex emergencies, genocide and crimes against humanity. But I think one of the really striking things about the book is a shift in the focus from the big picture politics of states and international organizations towards the population of concern. The book starts with human stories of refugees themselves. We learn of Mohammed and Fatima who fled Homs into Lebanon 
and access to resettlement to Canada and built a life in Canada. We learn about Ayesha leaving Rakhine State in Myanmar and trying to form a life in the camps in Cox's Bazaar in Bangladesh. And that brings a reason why we then want to understand and be curious about the definitions, numbers and categories that follow in the discussion. We're also drawn into a different set of solutions. Solutions, crucially in this book, don't just lie out there with big powerful states and UNHCR. Yes, they have to act, but this is a call to action, a call to action to all of us, to you, me, the broader public, to everyone with a whole of society approach to engage. And this comes through with recognition of the importance of refugee-led initiatives, the recognition of the work of the Global Refugee-Led Network, the role of local action and activism in Europe in the aftermath of the so-called European refugee crisis from Greece to Germany and beyond. And crucially within that, there's a recognition that even from the past, even from history, we see examples of leadership by civil society, by organizations and by the general public, transforming the debate and overcoming the type of polarization that we see in the present day with which Gill was so concerned. For example, he alludes to the World Refugee Year of 1959 and 1960. And ironically, that's an event that was transformative, that was initiated by somebody who was at the time a recent Oxford undergraduate, and remarkably led by a conservative British government at the time. I think it's a moment that shows from the past that when people work together in civil society, across political boundaries, around the world, transformation is possible. And when I reflected upon this shift almost to looking at the politics from the bottom up, I realized this wasn't a new theme in Gill's work. The bottom up idea of transformative change was present in calculated kindness. UNHCR and world politics ends with a really passionate call for refugees and the promotion of open societies. And so while many themes that are present in Gill's work are distilled, the transformation in the structures of global order, the challenge of uh, multipolarity beyond US hegemony, the challenge of new drivers of displacement such as climate change. Ultimately, I see this as a call to action for all of us. And Gill concludes really importantly with a message of what I see of hope and optimism. He concludes that although the scope of the challenge of refugees seems greater than ever, solutions can be found if states are willing to be part of that solution. States must do their bit, UNHCR must update itself to the new transforming world, but we're all part of finding those solutions and also working with the people most affected. So it is an incredibly important piece of work, which I think will be read by, used by, not only academics, but most importantly, I think for Gill, students, the general public, and everybody who has to be part of finding solutions. Alex, thank you very much. That's a, a very helpful and powerful, not only uh, engagement with the book and, and the power of this bottom-up message, but how that message has been so present for so long within Gill's work spanning decades. So now let's let's move to to Jeff Crisp. Uh, Jeff, your perspectives on the book. What's its important message? What contribution do you see it making? Jeff, over. Thanks very much, James. Uh, it's a really great privilege for me to participate in the launch of this book. Um, I first met Gill in 1983 when I started a job with the British Refugee Council in London, and we quickly struck up a very good friendship and worked together on a number of projects over the next four decades. And when I moved to Oxford a few years ago, we ended up sharing an office at the Refugee Studies Centre, and I cannot imagine a more congenial roommate. It's impossible to think of any other scholar who could have written such a comprehensive and insightful analysis of the global refugee issue in so few pages and in such an accessible style. While it's considerably shorter than his other books, I'm certain that this one will be considered as Gill's magnum opus. It's all the more remarkable that he was able to complete the book while suffering from serious health and mobility issues. And in that respect, the volume is also a tribute to Gill's incredibly supportive family. And of course, to James Milner, who was so supportive in Gill's latter years. Let me spend the rest of my time just highlighting three particular features of the book, which I think are particularly important. 
First of all, the book is deeply rooted in Gill's interest in and empathy for the world's uprooted people, as well as his determination to understand the human stories behind the refugee statistics. In that respect, and as Alex has already pointed out, it was entirely characteristic of Gill that the book should open with the stories of Mohammed, Fatima, Aisha, Tigish, Adriana and Satina, refugees and other false migrants whose life stories so vividly illustrate the analysis to be found in the subsequent pages of the book. The book is also emblematic of Gill's very human approach to the issue in the sense that it refuses to regard the global refugee population as an homogenous, undifferentiated and faceless mass. In that respect, I would particularly commend the substantial section of the book that looks at the specific attributes and vulnerabilities of refugee groups, such as women, children, adolescents, the elderly, people from the LGBT community, and of course, a subject that would become very close to Gill's heart, refugees with disabilities. And in that respect, let me draw your attention to a beautifully written paragraph on page 85 of the book, where Gill tells the story of a visit where he met refugees with disabilities in Thailand. And that was a visit that took place very shortly after the terrible bombing in Baghdad, which took him close to death and which claimed the lives of other outstanding humanitarians, including Sergio Vieira de Mello and Arthur Hilton. Uh, it's very noticeable that in that paragraph of the book, uh, Gil goes out, out of, goes out of his way to um, pay tribute to the, resilient, to the re resilience and the determination of the refugees with disabilities. And those were, of course, two attributes that Gil demonstrated in abundance in the later years of his life. Second, while Gil's book is mercifully free of the social science jargon that, in my own opinion, mars so much of the recent refugee studies literature, it's a, concept, it's a conceptually sophisticated volume. In particular, while recognizing that refugees constitute a specific group of people under international law with particular rights and obligations, Gill refuses to take a purist approach to the issue of categorization. As the book demonstrates, it's impossible to write about refugees without also considering the situation of other groups of people, such as those who are displaced within their own country, those who are stateless, those who are moving from one country to another for primarily economic reasons, as well as crisis migrants, the concept that uh, formula was formulated by Alex Betts to describe people who are fleeing from situations of severe danger and hardship, but who do not meet the criteria to be granted refugee status. In a sentence that will annoy some of my former colleagues at UNHCR, Gill writes that, I quote, by strictly distinguishing between two categories, two categories of people on the move, namely migrants and refugees, we risk ignoring the need for a more nuanced understanding of the often unjust social, economic and political structures prompting people to migrate or to flee their home countries. Third and finally, in his examination of the response to refugee movements and other forms of forced displacement, Gill places the role of UNHCR in a much broader perspective pointing out that much of the support provided to displaced populations comes from within their own communities, from host populations, civil society actors, and local NGOs. This was again a topic very close to Gill's heart, as demonstrated by his close involvement with the UNHCR initiative in the 1990s, known as Paranac, or Partners in Action, which was intended to strengthen the organization's relationship it, with the NGO community in regions with large refugee populations. Demonstrating the continuity of, of his interests and commitments, Gill devotes three pages of his last book to one of the most striking recent developments in the humanitarian world, namely the growth of refugee-led organizations and the associated demand that refugees should be more effectively listened to by states, the UN and international NGOs. As Gill concludes, and I quote, the most important action that international society can take to improve the global response to refugees is to give those who have been forcibly displaced a voice to express their views and requirements. This, he concludes, does not happen enough. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jeff. Um, that's, I think, a very 
uh, helpful point in, in, on which to end your intervention. And as we now transition to Mustafa, your perspective um, on the book uh, and, and very, very much uh, from this question of the, the, the emphasis that it places on refugee perspectives as, as, as something that is uh, highlighted by Alex as a feature of, of, of Gill's work for, for decades. But from your perspective as, a, as an advocate, as, a, as, as, a, as, a, as an activist within civil society, what's your sense of the contribution of the book uh, and, and how it can be used as we move forward? Uh, Mustafa, the floor. Thank you, James, and, and, and thank you, everyone, and, and Gil's family in particular for giving me the chance. Um, it, it is an honor of someone who's uh, very close to me, despite the fact that we surprisingly um, had never met in person. I think also we, we shared that we are uh, former basketball uh, lovers and players, too. That's something I practiced back home for about like six years professionally. Gil made me feel as a reader that when he started the book with the human stories, it wasn't to create sympathetic responses, but to make readers understand the realities through these stories. These stories make readers understand who their work is done for and encourage them to take actions and create understanding on a human and technical level in a genius way at the same time. I often meet master students, researchers, policymakers, asking me questions related to refugee issues that I'm surprised they need an answer to. Things like, what's the difference between IDPs and refugees? What is the global compact on refugees? Like, is it really 20 years that refugees stay in camps? And often I just kind of struggle to, to answer. But finally, with this book, I have found one source, one book I can recommend for. The writing style of this book is just perfect. It hits on every essential point from the clearer cut. Why do all these people flee their home countries? That's the question Gil started with. To the technical aspects of defining a refugees or a refugee. The straightforward nature of Gil's uh, book is fitting for its end message. Those solutions in this realm are present, are present and available with the right political and civic will. We constantly search for reasons why the global refugee regime does not adequately protect those it intended to do. And refugee participation is the missing piece of that puzzle. Gill writing leads the, the reader through these many complexities in an approachable way. And I'm sure many readers will become engaged with refugee issues because of this accessibility. Humans are adaptable creature. They are as tough as the circumstances around them and as they are as vulnerable and privileged as the circumstances they are presented with. From personal and many shared experiences, the refugee experience is a strange, it sucks, it's bad, demeaning, hurtful and breaking. Despite this, there is a special inner strength that we share and indescribable balance of both powerless and powerful forces that keep most of us alive, helpful, resourceful, and ready to fight. Not only for ourselves or our environment, but for the world to accept us and for humanity to do better. What still surprised me till today is that even when well-intentioned people enter the refugee workspace, with a lot of passion along the way, their emotions dissolve. Refugees themselves and their work simply become numbers. Grant writing, funding competitions, exclusive discussions and arguments. Gill, on the other hand, was one of the few exceptions. His emotion were live, real, compassionate, and his empathy was as still as strong as ever, uh, even after 40 years of doing the work. Gil did not leave us without making sure to bring this fight to his students, friends, and those around him who today are influential academics, policymakers, politicians, civil society leaders, practitioners, and fierce advocates. He left an incredible legacy. He once mentioned he wished to be a good analyst and a good activist. 
I can safely say today that Gil was a distinguished world-class analyst and a great and inspiring activist. I want to end my talking points by borrowing some of Gil's talking points in an appearance in 2017. He was emotionally describing what kept him going during and after surviving the Baghdad bombs incidents. Gil said, I remember promising myself that I would not die there. I survived and spent the next several years recovering and adjusting to a new life in a wheelchair. What kept me going both then and now has not only been the strong support from family and friends, but my life long experience with refugees. From them, I have learned about courage, inner strength and perseverance, even in the most heroic and most difficult circumstances. Thank you, Gil, for everything you have done for us refugees and for policymakers, researchers, students, and friends. Thank you again, James and Gil's family for trusting me and giving me this chance today. I think it's more than I deserve. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mustafa. Thank you. Jane Mary, um, let's turn to you in, in, uh, in Tanzania, in Dar es Salaam. From your perspective, Jane Mary, what, uh, from the perspective of civil society in a major refugee hosting country, what's your perspective of the contribution of the book or the lessons that we can take away from it? Um, Jane Mary, the floor. Thank you so much, Jane. And uh, thank you, everyone, especially to, to Anne and uh, Gil's daughters for having me uh, to be part of the speakers today. Unlike um, Professor Alexander and Jeff, I've never met uh, Jill before. I have come across his book in the passing. So this is the first book that I've read um, in full. But just by reading this book, I regret not meeting him in person. Uh, I would also like to thank um, Jill's family for supporting Jill's Resource Center, Dignity Kwanza. I, I believe that uh, it will give me more opportunity, opportunity to read more of his books as well. As you, uh, you introduced me, I work with Dignity Kwanza, that's a um, uh, non-government organization. Uh, but we are focusing on human rights of refugees and advocacy. So we uh, are regularly engaged by with refugees themselves, but also policymakers and practitioners. And this book to me, um, or, uh, the biggest message that I'm getting from this book is first of all, the honest on the reality that refugee problem and post displacement are complex subject. But despite that fact, they also touch the heart of humanity. Therefore, they cannot be escaped without betraying humanity. Whether the displacement is due to persecution or conflict or climate change in Jews' causes, the victims are human beings, men, women, boys and girls. Mohammed, Fatima, Ayesha, Tigis, that Jill mentioned uh, in chapter one of his book. These people have rights, have dreams, have ambitions, talents, emotions, etc. They need to be assisted to live safely and build their lives, either as refugees, internally displaced persons, or as migrants. So uh, this book has clearly acknowledged the challenge, the challenges in finding solutions, but at the same time shown that with the political will and the right approaches, the challenges are not insurmountable. Most practitioners and policymakers at uh, local levels don't have time for reading big uh, voluminous books. And um, this being a very short book, I am seeing it contributing a lot in the work I do, the advocacy work, informing um, policymakers and others of 
the, the entire refugee uh, subject because from this book you can get all the answers to, you can get all the answers you have to questions about refugees again in very few words and simple and easy to understand language. So this is I'm seeing it is a huge contribution in advocacy work than anywhere. If the book is able to reach many people, then it is going to have a big impact. Unfortunately, the line is fading. Could I ask you to, to leave the webinar uh, and rejoin? Uh, we heard the point about the, the value of the book being uh, more accessible and that more policymakers are likely uh, to, to read it. Um, but it's, I think it's important in terms of the utility of the book in the context within which you're working. Uh, but unfortunately, the, the internet is letting us down. Could I ask you to leave the webinar and rejoin with the same link and then we'll come back to you. Let me do that. Thank you. Thank you. Pole sana, Jane Mary. Thank you. Yes, thank you. As as Jane Mary is uh, is is leaving uh, and and rejoining, um, let me pose a, a first question um, that we have uh, received in the in the Q and A box uh, to you, uh, uh, Mustafa, Jeff, and Alex. Um, and it's the question about um, a question from Adam Roberts. Uh, wonderful for you to join us, uh, Professor Roberts. Um, the question is, how did Gill's work within this book and his work more generally, how was it able to navigate between what is often seen as an irreconcilable tension between the realist view of international politics as being state centered and interest driven and, and rooted in, in forms of coercive power? as opposed to the more idealist view uh, that is so uh, essential for mobilizing the kind of responses that we see. So how do we see this balance between a realist understanding of state-centered approaches to international politics? How do we see that balanced off with the idealism uh, that we've all highlighted in the reading of the book? Um, would anyone like to take a stab at, at that question uh, while we're waiting for Jane Mary to reply? Alex, do I see you reaching for your mute button? Happy to give you the floor, Alex. I'm happy to, to start with that one. Um, I think it's a great question. I think, um, I think one of the fascinating things about Gill's scholarship is that he writes about themes like international cooperation, more from a historical perspective than, than a sort of international relations theory perspective. So he doesn't discuss in his work self-identifying necessarily as a realist or an idealist. But I think what's interesting is analytically, there are many realist features to his work. Um, states, particularly in the early work, are the central actors. Um, international organizations matter insofar as they're able to influence states to change their behavior. But in, in outlook and in aspiration, Gill is closer to idealism. So I see his work as trying to channel um, a realist world towards idealism. Um, I mean, something that in international relations is closer to the aspirations of, of, of the English school or an international society approach to recognize that there are real world constraints to what we can achieve, to very soberly look at the world as it is and as we find it but then look for ways, look for levers of transformative change by which we get to a, a better future and more progressive outcomes. And so the themes of international order, is it a, a bipolar world? Is it the unipolar world? Are we shifting to multipolarity? That is a realist theme. The recognition that states are concerned with their security, that is a realist theme. But there are subtle elements of, of, of divergence from that. Um, that international organizations can and do have autonomy to make a difference, that other non-state actors can also make a difference, as we see in the BSI. And so I think partly what I think underlies that is um, the optimism, the hope, the sense that even if we look at the world as it is, it can be changed and transformed for the better, and states as actors working with others can do better on behalf of refugees. Yeah, thank you very much, Alex. I see that Jane Mary has, has rejoined us. Jeff and, and Mustafa, I'll give you a chance to come back on that question in a moment. But as we say, let's make hay while the sun shines. And, and Jane Mary, 
if your connection allows, I'd invite you to continue your uh, intervention. Uh, Jane Mary, over. Thank you, Jane. So um, uh, I don't even remember where I ended, uh, but I uh, was saying that um, generally the book is uh, is a book for everyone, uh, as, as it touches everything that one needs to know about refugees and post displacement. Um, another thing is that the book is not biased neither hypothetical. It has faces of people. It has acknowledged causes, challenges, and concerns that actors, sorry, successes, challenges, and concerns that actors in different positions at country and global level have, but still insisted that solutions can be found. The book has clearly shown the importance of inviting many actors in the search for solutions, including civil society organization, and it has successfully shown refugees agency um, as contributors to the host communities when given opportunities to do so by laws and policies. This is what um, most human rights and advocacy organizations like Dignity Kwanzaa have been waiting for, a book that is this much comprehensive. Because these are the questions that we are always asked when we do our advocacy. Do you know the concerns that we have? Have you thought of security issues? What about the high rate of unemployment in our country? These are the questions that we are always asked. But Jill have not forgotten about those issues. He has included them in his book. So anyone who can read the book will have the answer will be, uh, if he reads it with an open mind, it will help to think through about the issues. But the most important thing that Jill is bringing out in this book is the emphasis that the people, the issue that we're dealing with involves people and also calls for rights-based approach, looking at it from the human rights point of view and hence the emphasis that maybe it's not that necessary to distinguish refugees from other migrants, because at the end they face similar situations and they all need assistance. And the assistance that doesn't need, that doesn't end at relief only, it should go to the root um, issue, which is human rights. They are victims of human rights violations, so they should be treated, uh, the, the, the intervention should also uh, focus on human rights as well. So that, that, that's a very uh, strong message for people doing advocacy and organizations doing advocacy like mine. Let me end there for now, Jane. Thank you so much, Jane Mary, and, and thank you for your, uh, for your perseverance uh, with, with the technology. Jane Mary, I think your point about how, you know, how Gil would have been so thrilled that the idea that a book uh, of this nature uh, you know written in his home office in in Boar's Hill on on the on the outskirts of Oxford would would be usable in the context where you work in Tanzania to advance those kinds of of, of questions of, of rights-based solutions so thank you all for those interventions that we've we've received an, a number of really great questions in the Q&A box um, there were some scripted questions that I sent uh, to the presenters ahead of time. I'm going to throw those out because the questions we're getting in the Q&A box are, are frankly so much more interesting. Um, the first comes from uh, Barnanus uh, Asprey, who asks a question which I think is, is really, um, you know, speaks, uh, the, the question was posed in the context of, uh, of, of, of the global north in, in the west, the question about um, public discourse and how public discourse around refugees has become so constrained and so polarized. Um, as we've heard, this was something that really motivated Gill uh, to write the book, was to try and influence public discourse. So I'd like to ask um, each of you, from your perspective, uh, from the positions from which you work, having read the book, and, and given that we have uh, you know, 125 uh, colleagues on the line, many of whom are themselves activists engaged in, the, in this work, from your perspective, 
how do you think this book could be used as a tool to try and engage in a change in public discourse? The, the way that Gill wrote the book was the hope that individuals would read it and to make up the, take their own position uh, on these critical issues. But when we think about the more aggregate task of shifting public discourse more generally, how do you feel this book could be useful in reimagining public discourse when it comes to responses to refugees and critically solutions for refugees? Um, Jane Mary, your, your video is off, but if you'd like to come in on this, uh, Jane Mary, it's a theme in your intervention. Jane Mary, can I go back to you? How would you use this book to try and shift public discourse uh, in the region in which you work? Let me start with you and then uh, I can see Mustafa, Jeff and Alex, give me a signal if you'd like to come in next. But Jane Mary, let me give you the opportunity to answer that question. How would you use this book? Thank you, Jane. Um, for me, uh, the first thing is to, to see to it that the book get to as many people as possible again due to its uh to, to its simple language it means many people can read and comprehend and um, uh, you get the message clearly so the first thing is to get uh if possible to get the book to many people to get many people to read the book but um again to engage uh to engage uh future future practitioners and, and decision makers, that to say students. Uh, it's a book of reach to students. So that's, that's another way that the book can be used. But the message in the book can be shared by, by, by uh, can be shared to different uh, actors, mostly within the government, but also um, even outside the government. Um, as I was saying before, the message is in the book is, is so strong, and uh, it has it has all the, the it has most of the answers. Uh, it clearly explains the problem uh, that we are facing. It clearly links the pro problem with many other issues like development. So, um, have, first is having people to read it. Uh, that's the first, but also engage in various discussions about the issues that are um, presented in the book, creating space for dialogues for different um, actors to sit and, 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 and discuss these issues. I'm seeing the book as an opportunity, especially from where I'm seated, where uh, James, you know the situation that for, uh, for, for some time, discussions around uh, refugee issues hasn't been that much welcome. But the way the book is packaged, uh, anyone uh, would feel free to discuss the content of the book. So I'm seeing it as a tool, but also as a door opener to, to uh, creating uh, 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 space for discussion and bringing back the issues that probably uh, we had not yet before found a, a, a better way of putting them down, but I think Jill has really helped us in doing so. So that's how that's 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 how I will, if I, that's how I, I I could use the book here. Thank you, Jane Mary, and I I have this lovely vision of of Gil Losher VSI book clubs springing up uh, around the world, but I I think it is an important challenge that um you know gill isn't with us to mobilize the book so the more uh those of us on this call and, and and elsewhere can think of ways of of getting people not only to read the book but to talk about it and talk to each other about it i think is a very helpful uh, a very helpful point um mustafa you're unmuted I, I think you wanted to come in on this point and then jeff and and alex i'll invite you as well mustafa um thank you james i think <sighs> You know, when, when I was reading the book after um, over 40 years of work in the refugee space, is, and, and someone for Gil, like you, you would expect there would be a lot of complexity in the book. There will be a lot of technical terms. There was like kind of digging a little bit deeper and all of that. And to be honest, like in, in the beginning, I was like, is that going to be the case? 
Um, but then you go through the book and in, 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 in many cases, it's just two hours to three hours. I think really what genius about it, like who can today, and, and I never thought before, just like who can today explain or give you kind of a clear uh, 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 understanding and a bit of solution about the refugee issues, not only for those who advocate for refugees, but even for those like even I want to go even as far as like those who are against refugees coming to countries and all of that. Like I think just reading into this, understanding, getting ideas in in two hours, uh, um, that's where the book can be can be used, and that's kind of what really uh, um, important about it is the fact that it's a two to three hours read, and people can engage in the conversation and get a bit better understanding and get a bit of a solution. I think really, um, like m maybe my my uh, my mind was blown in a way is like, you know, I think that that was the the the, the results of of over forty years of work that you can simplify it because the refugee issue is not simple. Uh, very complex, but at the same time for someone after 40 years to come and simplify it in that way and give you that better understanding and have a bit more discussions. And and, and I think, you know, someone after 40 years just kind of to go and then give you uh, a clear, uh, uh, straightforward solutions, for example, the including of refugees. And I think even to the previous points in terms of like the 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 idealism and, and, and realist uh, um, kind of a concept, to be honest, I, I don't I don't think there is that much of a complex into it today. Like even in numbers, there is a one person who's forcibly displaced out of ninety seven. So today, to, you talk in numbers worldwide, refugee issues. We're talking about like you know less than than one percent if the world wanted to include it. I think what Gil in this book, or even over overall, that solutions for refugees are a bit simpler. I think it's just kind of the world is, is the one who's like most complicated. And I think that's what the bridge the book can bring to the, uh, to the table. Thank you, Mustafa. Uh, Jeff, uh, you wanted to come in on this? Yeah, thanks, James. <clears throat> if I could just link this question to the, the first question, which, the very interesting question asked by Adam Roberts. I mean, I'd never thought about it in these terms before, but I think if I could summarize uh, Gill's character, it would be a realist with strong ideals. And I think realism with strong ideals is a, a perfect basis for effective advocacy. And a lot of the advocacy I see these days, particularly in the kind of Twitter sphere, um, it doesn't really, it's not always anchored in that kind of understanding of the realities of state power and state interest. So having that base in reality that Gill's work always shows is a fantastic basis uh, for advocacy. I also think, it, again, uh, a reflection prompted by Adam's first question. I'd never really thought of uh, Gill as an international relations specialist. I always always read his work and appreciated much of more as a historian. And the fact that even when Gill was writing about contemporary events, as he is in this very short introduction, his basic objective is to tell an effective story and then to take conclusions and recommendations from that story. And I've always been struck not only in this book, but in his previous work, by the extent to which uh, Gill is able to avoid academic, bureaucratic, and technocratic jargon. And again, I think that is absolutely essential in terms of communicating effectively with politicians and policymakers. We need to use language that they can understand. And then just finally, I think uh, just in the few months since uh, Gill sadly passed away, the asylum situation in his adopted homeland, the UK has deteriorated very seriously. And I think the book coming out at this particular moment in time where there are some really horrendous asylum proposals on the table from the government, I think it's really a time to think about how we're going to advocate effectively against those proposals. Yeah, thank you very much, Jeff. Um, Alex, did you want to come in on this point? I don't have much to add, but I agree that it, it serves a function of, of public engagement. Um, that it bridges the gap between academia. And, and we've heard also Jeff's explained how, I mean, unfortunately, a lot of refugee and forced migration studies is mired in very complex social science language and is quite loaded with jargon that makes it less accessible and less relevant than it might be. And this book is uniquely placed um, to bridge that gap and make 40 years of academic research accessible to literally anybody. There are no barriers to entry to being able to read and understand this book. And I think Mustafa's point is absolutely right, that part of the outcome of that is you go away feeling 
it's not that complicated. We can find solutions. They are within our grasp because of that clarity that's, that's provided. And so I, I, I think getting it out there is the challenge for all of us, as you said, James. And, and I suppose there I'd have a, a question for us to follow up on, which is what can we arrange potentially with the publisher, um, Oxford University Press, to enable it to be made widely accessible, um, even in digital form, to audiences who might not be able to access it readily so that it has influence. Um, and I think that's, the book does the work when it's in people's hands. And I think the only other thing I'd add is it's, it's a unifying book. Um, it's not divisive. It doesn't pick fights. It's a book that irrespective of background, um, political starting point, I think people can get behind, which I think is also a really exciting feature. Yeah, no, thank you, Alex. And it's interesting on that point, we, we had a, a question in the Q&A box, uh, which asked whether there are any plans to translate this book uh, into other languages. So not only make it more widely accessible, uh, but to make it av available in uh, in Arabic, in Spanish, in uh, in Russian, and you know that there's a lot that can be imagined with that kind of possibility. So I believe there's a colleague from OUP that's on the webinar. So be forewarned that there's going to be an email coming from me with with some of these questions after the webinar. Um, there's another question that we received uh, from Themriz Khan in, uh, in in Pakistan, which which I think is is quite interesting. One of the the points that uh, Gil uh, raised, certainly in detail in UNHCR and world politics, and that he mentions to a certain extent in VSI, are sort of some of the alternate possibilities of what might have been. Um, Gil uh, takes pains to remind us that the, the the contours of the refugee regime that we have today, certainly the mandate of UNHCR, uh, was not the only option on the table, that there were competing visions in 1949 of, of what the refugee regime could look like, um, most notably from, from India and Pakistan, having come from the experience of partition in 1947, imagining a much more robust and permanent international organization. Um, Thamriza's question is then, you know, with this starting point that we have, why is it that international institutions seem to, uh, you know, arguably have become more distant? Uh, Mustafa, you sort of made the point about how, um, you know, those engaged in refugee issues, have, there, there might be a tendency of focusing on, on statistics and getting further away from the sort of the idealism that, that motivated Gill's work. So there's a question of, of, of how this book uh, you know, provides ideas on how those institutions within the regime might be reinvigorated. Um, Jeff, this was a question that I was going to pose to you about how the book gives us ideas on how to make better use of the tools that we have. But there's also a question that was posed uh, by uh, an anonymous uh, participant in the Q&A box about what does the book tell us about how this 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 sort of collaborative approach that Gil talked about of it not just being states and UN agencies, but being civil society, being refugee led organizations, being citizen groups. What are the lessons from the book in terms of how these connections, how the responses can be greater than the sum of its parts? What are the examples or the or the lessons that we can derive? from how this kind of collaborative, joined up, whole of society approach might be encouraged? How do we turn that idea into reality? Are there tools or lessons from the book that help us do that? Um, I invite uh, uh, to either unmute or give me a signal and I'll, I'll turn the floor. Mustafa, you won the race to the mute button. Uh, Mustafa, let me give you the chance. And uh, Jane Mary, when Mustafa is done, because I can't see you, if you'd like to come in, Jane Mary, after Mustafa, feel free to do so. And then I'll invite either Jeff or Alex to, to speak to this point. Uh, Mustafa, go ahead, please. I think very, thank you, James. Very, very quick two points. Uh, at first, in, in my opinion, more than the book offers solutions, and, and it does offer solutions in, in, in many ways, but I think it offers most importantly, a reality check, uh, an, an understanding of, of um, again, the, 
the the simplicity of of solutions or path to take and kind of a, a reality understanding of the whole system in general. On the second point, in terms of like that collaboration ever whole society approach, I, I understand that a lot of people think about it like you know it's very complex and and they think about it from a from a perspective is like how I'm going to include everyone. Actually, I've heard a few times in Geneva, it's like, I mean, wake up. There are thousands of refugee led organizations. I'm going to work with all of you as like, you know, and millions of refugees. I'm going to include you. And to be honest, sometimes those kind of rhetoric just being used as an, in, in my opinion, as an excuses, not kind of to, to, to change the concept. So all that to say, to be honest, like, I think that the book kind of gives a little bit impression about some of the missing pieces of that puzzle for the work. That being said, there are already existing circles and group of work. I think if each of that group can bring a one or two uh, missing pieces of that puzzle and just trying to include it, create a demo of a whole society approach by being inclusive within that group. And I think that small action, a simple one action, uh, if you, I mean, just for example, because I, I kind of advocate on this, if, if you don't have a refugee led organization on your group, so bring that. If you don't have a refugee uh, with expertise on this, then bring it. If if your group can basically empower and fund some refugee led organization, so do it or like, you know, have a bit a different understanding of the definition. So those kind of small action would lead necessarily on a long run to a whole society approach. But I don't think people should think about it as like, how I'm got that small group will bring the whole society approach, which, you know, they'd start thinking about thousands and millions of numbers. Those kind of two points. Yeah, thank you, Mustafa. Um, Jane Mary, would you like to come in on this point? So um, I agree with, with Mustafa that um, there are already, uh, already uh, structures that we can, we can adopt. And um, from, uh, I'm going straight to the same, how about the collaborations and connections? Uh, how can they be encouraged? So first of all, is, um, for me, I think we need to, to have better coordination. Uh, better coordination because I, I think by now we all we know most of the actors and I want to draw I, I want to draw an example from um, COVID nineteen with all its uh, with all its uh, its um, uh, the problems that it has brought us but there are some few things that we can learn from it from it uh, we have learned a lot uh, about coordination when it came uh, during uh, during COVID nineteen and this is the time uh, at least from where I am where we learned the importance. Uh, the importance of including refugees, for example, uh, because we could see clearly how helpful they were uh, um, uh, in responding to COVID-19 at the time when uh, uh, UNHCR, uh, international organizations, national and local organizations probably could not um, could not access uh, refugees, um, but again another thing that you have learned from from COVID nineteen is that um, we need to to have everyone on board because health of this was was there. Uh, let me talk a lot about uh, uh, when refugees uh, arrive in countries in host countries. We know them. So uh, we need to find means to collaborate with them. We need to find means to, to, to learn everyone's strength and what they can bring uh, on the table and um, enhance these, 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 uh, uh, these uh, uh, capacities that, that, that exist. So the importance uh, of recognizing, uh, recognizing the, 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 the partners and uh, Coming up with a, with a good uh, a good uh, uh, way of, of coordinating what they are doing, but the most important thing is again um, ensuring that uh, they get they, they they are able they have capacity to do what we expect them to do, and this capacity doesn't just come uh, uh, from the air; it's built and harnessed. So uh, I believe that. Uh, there is a, there, there, it's very possible to encourage these, these connections. Thank you, Jim. Thank you very much, Jane Mary. Um, Jeff or Alex, do, do either of you want to, uh, Jeff, I think your hand was up. Let me go to you next, Jeff. Um, and Alex, I'll give you a chance and then I'm going to basket a few questions together. 
with the 15 minutes we have left. Jeff? Yeah, I mean, again, I think the timing of the publication of this book is extremely good because there is a kind of a, a, a debate bubbling up about what the future of the international refugee regime is going to look like. And I think we've forgotten that, as you pointed out, James, that, you know, four or five decades ago, there were alternative visions on offer. And we, we take what is the current regime to be for granted. Um, now, if you look at the current regime, it's clearly dominated by some very large organisations, UN agencies such as UNHCR, IOM, OCHA, also by some very large international NGOs, CARE, World Vision, Oxfam, etc. There does seem to be some kind of debate bubbling up now about whether this is a sustainable and viable way forward. Um, just a couple of reports I've read in the last few days, one, one from the Overseas Development Institute in London, which said that despite all of the talk about refugee and beneficiary participation over the last 30 years, nothing essentially has changed. And another report by ALNAP um, saying that the way in which the large humanitarian agencies evaluate their programs very much evaluates them on their own terms. It takes for granted that the objectives of those programs are the right objectives and tries to see whether those objectives are being fulfilled rather than asking the much bigger question of whether the objectives are the right ones in the first place. And I think the whole focus on localizations, on refugee-led organizations, local NGOs that has really come to very quick prominence over the past three or four years is really kind of challenging that approach. And so I guess, I think, you know, again, the timing of this book uh, is exceptionally uh, favorable one to reinforce and stimulate that debate about the future of the international refugee regime, whether it can be more rooted in grassroots activities. Thank you, Jeff. Um, Alex, did you want to come in on that point? Yeah, I mean, I think despite the book's focus on a whole of society approach, I mean, it, it does ultimately recognize that states and UNHCR are still very, very important and influential actors, and that ultimately they determine the trajectory of the international refugee regime. The, the book highlights, though, that the refugee regime was born with a series of distinctive limitations. Um, UNHCR's executive committee is, is a weak governance mechanism for the book. There's the absence of a treaty body for the 1951 convention. There's reliance on voluntary contributions by a handful of donors with very particular interests. There's almost silence on responsibility sharing within the 1951 convention. So it recognizes there are those inherent weaknesses. And then it puts them at the contemporary juncture, recognizing that there's a big and profound shift in international order to a multipolar system in which old sources of influence that we saw in the 90s and early 2000s of US leadership can no longer be taken for granted, in which we have new drivers of displacement, including but not reducible to climate change, where we have increasing complexity of the number of policy fields involved. And so the book lays out a challenge for UNHCR and the refugee regime to grapple with a very difficult world. And it's quite sympathetic to that. It's sympathetic to the position UNHCR is in, but recognizes that the challenge for UNHCR is to be more strategic. And that's a constant refrain in Gill's work that's present in this book. To be, to take seriously its facilitative and catalytic role in trying to influence governments, even in a context where that's very difficult. Even when we see states like the British government, as Jeff's described, um, rolling back on their commitment to asylum. I interpret the kind of call in Gill's book to say, yes, this is a very difficult moment. We need to update, but despite the limitations, UNHCR is an indispensable actor and it needs to show leadership to, to take states with it on a journey into the new, the new challenging um, global order and international political economy um, that we face. So, I think in a way, rather than providing one blueprint for those next steps, it calls for leadership and says we can all be part of that leadership journey. But ultimately, let's not romanticize the fact that it comes exclusively from civil society. It has to be civil society changing how states and UNHCR act. Yeah, no, thank you very much, Alex. And, and that actually leads very well um, to the, the Spoiler alert, um, Andreas Feldman, a, 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 a PhD student uh, of, of Gill's, uh, many, Andreas, I won't say how long ago, uh, but when Gill was at the University of Notre Dame, uh, Andreas now at uh, the University of Illinois at Chicago, 
has asked us as a final question, which is not the question I'm about to pose, but the final question that I will pose is to ask uh, each of us to reflect on how Gill's approach, not his work, but Gill's approach to the, to the issue has influenced the way that we approach the issue. So that'll be the last question that I ask you to answer um, in a sentence or two. And Andreas in the Q&A box said that I need to put myself on the spot and answer that question as well, otherwise I get off the hook. So that's gonna be the last question that I pose. But before I do, I, I do want to give a chance, there's a, a series of questions. Uh, Matty Valmaki uh, has, has written in the Q&A box, uh, Alex and, and Jeff, you alluded to this. What this tells us about the future of the refugee regime, not just the inevitable future, but the possible future of the refugee regime. And I think within that, um, to also reflect on a question that comes from Anila Noor, uh, who's with us online, and, and a similar question posed by Osama Salim. Osama, I just need to say publicly, thank you so much for introducing me to Mustafa uh, in 2018. Uh, There's it been just a remarkable uh, experience since then, so thank you for that. A question from Anila Noor and Osama Salim essentially is, what are the lessons that we can take away from this book when it comes to e e equipping and empowering and refining the impact of refugee leaders? So as we, the, the, maybe my last question, uh, my last substantive question before we do the reflection, I'm gonna ask each of you to, to, to reflect on this question of not only what the book tells us about the the current state of the regime, but what, what's the future that we can imagine? And within imagining that future, what are the tools that we can take away from this book to really put in the hands of, you know, not just refugee leaders, but Jane Mary, I'd also say civil society leaders in major refugee hosting regions like East Africa. What's the future? What's the vision? And what are the tools from this book that can help get us there? Jeff seems to be having some technical difficulties. Mustafa, let me go to you, please, and then Alex, and then to Jane Mary. Mustafa, go. Um, thank you, James. It's not going to be a better future. Um, I mean, I, th th this, despite the fact that I always want it to be optimistic and all of that, but um, again, we go back to be a realist. Uh, uh, I, don't, I don't think the future, uh, we, we, we've always seen uh, an, 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 an crazy increase in, in refugee numbers. Uh, from 2012 to today, uh, the, the numbers has doubled. There are some studies we're talking about, like, you know, in 2050, that there will be a 1.2 billion refugees. We're not talking about a million anymore. Um, so I think really, uh, um, th th this is, again, more of a reality check that we need to be ready to a future where we would see uh, more displaced people, not only because of conflict, but now we're talking about you know climate change, or we're talking about you know the the, the, the economic migration and, and all of that. I think really, but with this future, the, the the vision is that it's it's more inclusive societies, um, it, or let me say like sometimes when I say more inclusive society, as if like you know I'm advocating for for the good of the world. I think, to be honest, it, maybe I want to go back to a sentence that I heard, is that migration is a fact, inclusion today is a choice. And I think if we choose not to include and not to work people like this is not, it's going to cost us even a lot more than what it costs us to be smart and including those people and work with them and all of that. So definitely the, the vision is more collaborative, more inclu inclusive and smart society together. I think what the book today, um, uh, the tool of the book uh, that give us is, is maybe, uh, um, a, you know, points and, and advice and, and, and perspective towards solution and how can that society be inclusive? How can society be collaborative? How can we, you know, those millions of people fleeing and all of that, how can we, you know, they, 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 don't, they don't become only a beneficiary, but they become partners, they become stakeholders, they become part of that solutions uh, um, that the world would face, not kind of, you know, the, the, the issues that they're facing on their own, because, you know, it's, it's, I think it's a world problem, not the other way around. So that's kind of what I feel the tool, uh, the book gives. And, and again, I'm going to reiterate on, on that point. It is simple. 
uh, um, but but sometimes with that simple, like with that kind of a, a simple solution, it's very complex for us to understand or kind of to 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 realize that is a simple. I think sometimes it's that simple. Then you think is like, oh, there's something hidden. There is a catch. No, I think the book just is a constant reminder. Here are some of the tools. Those kind of the advice. It is somehow simple. Thank you, Mustafa. Um, Alex, did you want to come in on this? Yeah, just three quick points. I think the first one is that um, we have to collectively engage with the root causes. So this is a theme in the book, but it's a theme throughout Gill's work to, to recognize the causes of displacement and think about how we can cooperate on resolving those as well as simply responding to displacement. And I think the, the focus in the BSI on new drivers of displacement and the, the mention of ideas like survival migration draws attention that we can't bury our heads in the sand on the fact that climate change will have a big influence, that fragile and failed states will have a big influence, that food and water insecurity will have a big influence. And so we have to recognize that displacement numbers are likely to grow and that's the world we find ourselves part of and so partly that's that's putting weak societies back together rather than requiring people to flee in the first place i think the second emphasis we get is is a sense of um the challenge around influencing governments to be open both because of the diagnosis of where we are with the distribution of power in the international system that we're going from a moment where the United States was able to provide leadership um, behind the United Nations for multilateralism towards one where we get the rise of China, the BRICS, and an unresolved sense of where that leads international liberal order in the future. And in the West, we therefore have divided societies where people are fearful of the loss of power, the loss of jobs, the loss of economic influence, and that's leading to division, misinformation, and backlash. And so I think there's a, a call for how we engage domestically and collectively in trying to ensure that, that we leave that space for openness. And the third area, I think, that, that is a bit more optimistic is it says that within that challenging, deeply challenging context, it relies upon strategic leadership and facilitation by UNHCR, by the UN system, by other interested organisations, to bring different actors together, to build common narratives, but crucially, and this is what I take from, from Gill's work as a whole, to be politically engaged, to recognise the politics, to move beyond charity, to not hope that altruism does the work, but understand the power relations, the interests, the ideas, and try to channel them into greater opportunities for protection, assistance and solutions. Thank you, Alex. Um, Jane, Mary, let, let me go to you. We're, we're, uh, uh, I offer you the chance to take the floor. Jane, Mary? Yes, thank you, Jane. Uh, for me, uh, I, I'm seeing the future still not so clear. Um, of course, as I already mentioned, that the, the numbers of uh, displaced people increase. But uh, for, uh, another reason why I'm feeling like it's still not clear is because most of the solutions that we're talking about um, relies on the political will that has always been difficult to really um, get from from um, uh, different people either in, at national level or globally so I, I that's how i'm seeing it and um, but on the flip side um, especially on the increase of of, of uh, uh, situations that are forcing people to 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 be displaced uh maybe uh, as the problem is becoming larger as we're anticipating it may push us to finding solutions so maybe it may ignite this political will that we are we are lacking so that's 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 the, the, the flip side of it and in terms of the tools that that um, we think the book gives us 
securing uh, in securing the future. Um, for me, I look at um, uh, the 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 direction that the book is taking us towards. Uh, looking at the, the causes, uh, causes of, of, of displacement, root causes. Uh, this is something that uh, in our responses, most of the time, people feel like maybe it's an area that you would have the, the inclusion and um, collaboration that the book is calling for. If we go for that, uh, I feel like we may be able to, to uh, get a more, a clearer future. But again, the human rights approach that uh, the book is also talking about. Thank you very much, Jane Mary. Uh, Jeff, would you like to offer a quick question to that? And then I'm going to give everyone a, a, a one-line answer to the question from Andreas before we conclude. Uh, Jeff, uh, over to you if you'd like to take the floor. Oh, in the interest of time and my very bad connection, I'm going to skip that question and go on to the next one. Okay, thank you very much. So last last point, a final word. How has Gil as a as a person, uh, how has Gil's legacy influenced the way that you uh, engage with the issue of forced migration? In one line, and I'll go last. Alex, first to you. I, I think it's very difficult to do justice in one line. I think one emphasis is on the role of individuals, and, and you see that through the impact of Gil himself as an individual. Um, I often find myself asking, what would Gil do in moments of doubt? Uh, and I can only aspire to do things with the, the integrity that Gil often does them. But I think in his work, individuals matter. Individual leadership is important. And as a historian, he gets at that in a way that political scientists simply can't. So from looking at high commissioners in UNHCR and world politics, to looking at presidents and calculated kindness, the individual can shape the world and lead to better outcomes. And if anyone's in doubt of that, just in UNHCR and world politics, comparing the sort of the praise for people like Sadruddin Aga Khan with at times, see page 18, the withering critique of Sadako Agata's UNHCR at the turn of the millennium, individuals make a difference. Thank you very much. Um, Jeff, let me go to you. In terms of what I've drawn from Gill's work over the years, I've written three simple things down. Uh, firstly, there's, there's always room for the big picture approach and a global approach. A lot of the research undertaken these days in advocacy is very, very specific and increasingly specific. I have really learned from Gill the value of a big picture approach. Secondly, as Alex I think just said, understand the history of a situation and also tell your stories well. You're not going to convince people of anything unless you tell those stories well, unless you have a good grasp of their historical origins. And then thirdly, something that just occurred to me is Gill's ability to put himself in other people's positions, whether it's talking about a, a refugee with disabilities in Thailand or whether he's talking about the High Commissioner for Refugees. I think Gill always managed to put himself in the position of that person, understand what their concerns and perspectives and interests and aspirations were. And I think for those of us involved in advocacy, it's very easy to get become very critical of everybody else. Um, without really understanding the position that they're in and their particular perspective. So my third point from Gill's work is put yourself in other people's position. Thank you, Jeff. Um, Mustafa. Um, I'm just trying to put this in the best way possible. Um, I, I think uh, b before Gill's work, uh, dealing with students and friends of Gills, um, like you, James, and, and Alex, and others that I've dealt before, um, I can admit that, um, like many other refugees, we always had that trust issues. Uh, trust issues in the white man, trust issues in the global system, trust issues in that kind of a saver behavior, the, the, the West world and all of that, it's always exists. And rightfully so, and, 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 and I still acknowledge that, and, and today I, I am a privileged uh, uh, refugee, so I want to compare self, myself with, with everyone else. But I think what, what slowly uh, I learned or what Gil's work and students and friends and, and kind of, you know, uh, colleagues after uh, offers a, a ray of hope, offers a, um, a kind of, you know, a, a possibility that a collaborative work might happen. 
um, a trust can be rebuilt, uh, not completely, but it's just a small step that there is something over there that we can all of us work together when there are genuine people on the other side, kind of, you know, and then we need to kind of work together uh, one step at a time. Um, I think that's what, what, what offered me in a way kind of, you know, uh, for me on a personal level kind of reduces a bit the anger. It, it, it doesn't eliminate it, of course, but it, it reduces it a bit. Um, and, and, and that kind of makes me do uh, um, the things I'm advocating for um, a bit more efficient. Um, that's it. Thank you, Mustafa. Jane Mary. Uh for me, quickly, uh, is uh, to confront difficult dis discussions. Um, and I'm referring to the way Gil has, um, throughout his book, not forgotten about other migrants, vulnerable migrants. Most of the times when we talk about refugees, we just focus to the strict definition of refugees and forget the vulnerable migrants. Uh, but majority of people, Dignity Kwanzaa is working with uh, in the rest of them, uh, these vulnerable migrants. And it has always been very difficult for us to put a message across. And um, we always have a fear of uh, being accused of working with the illegal migrants. We know at the back of our minds that they have um, many humanitarian and human rights issues that need to be addressed. But then there's always that. Um, Kind of reluctance of really putting that forward but seeing how Jill has done that in this book has really uh, changed me uh, uh, somehow helped me to really focus on this book as well thanks well thank you very much jane mary and mustafa and jeff and alex um andreas you said that i don't get off lightly that i need to answer the question as well I agree with everything that everyone has said. There's just one more thing that I would add. Um, I will never forget the patience with which Gil responded to my impetuousness and my impatience. Um, Gil was always profoundly kind and profoundly curious, uh, Jeff, to your point, uh, from the, the, the point from which other people were engaging. Gil always included in an interview asking about the other person. If there was a UNHCR official, where were you posted before this? What's your, what's your story? Who are you as a human being? So the two lessons that I take from Gil that has really influenced my work is the extremely high standard that he sent, uh, uh, set for being a profoundly decent and kind human being as we do this work. But for me, the greatest lesson is I'll never forget a dinner that Gil and I were having in Geneva with my enraged disposition that you know history had been forgotten and yet again this this experiment was being tried and has no one learned and gil very patiently reached across the table put his hand on my hand and said james lasting change takes time and i will never forget those words and i'm forever grateful if we continue to work together I really do believe that we can achieve some of the change uh, that Gil hoped to see. And I think that this book gives us a very powerful guide on how we can do it. So with that, uh, we've taken 10 more minutes of everybody's time, but I think it was very worthwhile. Uh, my profound thanks, Jane Mary, for your navigating uh, the technology and the bandwidth. Mustafa, for your trust and your candor. Uh, Jeff, for your uh, honesty and sincerity and, and sharing the, the the long relationship that you had with Gil and these perspectives and Alex, as always, your 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 clarity, your precision, and and your optimism uh, in in the power that this area of work can can realize in bringing about the change that we hope to see. My thanks to to Anne and to Margaret and Claire for your words. Uh, let me remind everyone that the details for ordering the book uh, are in the chat box, along with the link to the Gil Losher Memorial Fund. I invite you to, to, uh, to visit that site and to learn more about that. Um, my thanks to, to Richard, Nadia, and the team at LEARN who made the technology possible uh, to keep us all connected. Um, thank you. Um, and my sincere thanks to 128 colleagues from around the world who stayed with us and, and enjoyed this conversation. Gil would have loved this. 
this would have just been so amazing to see who was able to join in this conversation. But let's not stop here. Uh, we will be producing a recording of this event. We'll be posting it online. I like Jane Mary's uh, rallying cry, uh, get copies of this book into people's hands and don't just ask them to read it, talk to them about it. Use this as a tool to start that conversation and continue that conversation. Um, but wherever you are, wherever you're tuning in, uh, I hope you're safe and well as these extraordinary times continue. Thank you, everybody. Thank you to our speakers. Thank you for everyone in the audience. Take good care. Thank you very much.